or anything uh, for, <clears throat> for clarification or questions, I'm totally open to, um, if we need to touch on a point right away, that's totally fine. Um, um, I just can't see all the, the whole screen while I'm sharing screen. So just pull, <laughs> pull, pull my, uh, pull my tail there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me, uh, National Young Farmers. Uh, it's it's uh, really a truly an honor to be here um, and to be with um, friends and family today. I see some faces that um, that I'm familiar with, so hello, and um, to folks who I who I don't know or who I haven't run across. Um, you know, good to meet you. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I would. I, I was kind of following the chat a little bit, but um, I was just curious where people are coming from. Um, you guys know I'm from Detroit. This is a story from Detroit. So, if you can share in the chat, what city um, and state are you coming from, just so I can get a sense of who's in the room while I get going here. Um, I would love to hear, you know, hear hear where you guys are from. Um, to take that into account. Awesome. We got San Antonio. Okay, Sarasota, West Virginia. What's up, Hamtramck? Okay. Richmond. We got LA in the house. All right, Chi Town. Um, Des Moines in the house. Okay. All right. Mil Milwaukee. Yes. Okay. Madison. I was just there not too long ago. Uh, NC, North Carolina in the house. Lansing, hello. Uh, Grand Rapids, hello. These are my Michiganders. <laughs> um, all right. Hey, Detroit, what's up? What up, though? That's what we say in Detroit, what up, though? <laughs> um, thanks for that. I just wanted to kind of see where folks were coming from on the call. Um, this uh, this picture right here, um, I'm going to jump in, but this picture right here is really um, special to me because um, this is a neighborhood in Detroit, um, comes from a neighborhood in Detroit called Brightmore, which has really used urban farming to organize their, their neighbors and their neighborhood. Um, and so this is a neighborhood that is experiencing um, extreme, extreme vacancy, um, and they've turned that narrative around. Uh, using farming. So I thought this was a perfect picture for the things that we want to talk about um, tonight. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I would be remiss not to mention the general kind of tension that we're, that we're, um, that we're, that we're seeing in our country today, right? And no matter like what side of the aisle you're on or what your strategy was in this election, um, I do think it, was abundantly clear um, last week that you know our country is is pretty divided on a lot of issues, um, and kind of the organizing work that it's going to take to realign us. My heart and my spirit. I'm an, I'm an organizer, um, so I love people. I love to listen to people. Um, I love uh, I love people coming together, and um, in that process, I've learned a lot here. Um, here in the city. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you about. So we, um, this, you know, this talk is called um, collectivism. So I just wanted to stop and um, I think the term is, is pretty, um, you know, self-intuitive, but, um, but I just wanted to stop and pause and say like, what is it actually that we're talking about? Um, collectivism isn't new. Um, it's, it's a concept that is deeply rooted in a lot of our communities um, that have relied over the years on mutual aid and mutual support from each other. These have come from indigenous practices from, to African communal traditions. Um, it's about prioritizing the good of the whole um, and pooling our resources, sharing labor and protecting each other's well-being um, because in many ways our survival um, depends on it, right? Um, if we look at um, challenging the systems that are here and that um, have have harmed a lot of our communities, um, collectivism is a way to, um, I believe, is a way to address that. So um, I wanted to share some examples from across the world, though. Um, in Latin America, indigenous communities, um, they use a system called Minga, where people come together and they, um, they work on shared tasks that benefit the whole community. 
Um, that can be things like building a road together, or of course, like harvesting crops. Um, in East Africa, there is a concept called Harambe, which means um, all pulled together. So um, if you're familiar with uh, some of the Kwanzaa traditions that in the um, Black community, uh, you know, we always say Harambe, Harambe, right? So uh, that's all pulled together. It means um, uh, communities collectively gathering their resources um, for, uh, for the betterment of the whole. Uh, the Bantu people who are indigenous to Southeast and Central Africa, they have a set of values called Ubuntu that, um, that emphasizes interconnectedness um, of people with their communities and the world around them. Um, and then uh, for folks uh, coming from the indigenous communities, uh, the term all my relations, you may have heard this. Um, I've done sweat lodges, sweat lodges, you go in and you go out and say all my relations or way to greet people. Um, this is the term that really does emphasize the interconnectedness of all of us, right? Humans, animals, plants, and the environment. Um, and those principles really align closely to what um what I mean when I say collectivist um, principles. Um, it's the it's the process of prioritizing the group over the individual. Um, you know, I wanted to just mention that this term and this um, this value is somewhat opposite to what we have now um, in our system of capitalism. And, and um, capitalism, as we know it and how we've all been raised, tends to prioritize um, the individual gain, um, competition, and profit. Um, capitalist, uh, capitalism tells us that the success of the individual, that making it means getting ahead of others, whereas collectivism is, is, is the opposite. It's um, sharing our success. It's knowing that our success depends on each other. Um, and by doing so, uh, we create systems that um, can ch challenge our current capitalistic system. All right, I wanna share with you some of the work we've been doing in Detroit as a way to talk about um, kind of a community that we built here in Detroit and, and values that we're working on building and some of the lessons that I've, um, that I've learned along the way. So um, I'll just start with the quick we crap. If you're not uh, familiar with Detroit, um, one of Detroit's biggest challenges and um, I say assets, um, is the amount of vacant land that we have in our city. So all the, the black dots that you see on here, on this map here, um, is vacant land. Most um, experts say that we're, you know, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent vacant, um, vacant land. Um, our city is really built for two million people in its heyday. You know, in its heyday in the in the 50s, in the roaring 50s, we were, um, you know, we were one of the richest economies on the planet. And that was back, I mean, I'm sorry, on, in the country. And we, um, you know, that came from our, our history of um, automotive industry here in Detroit. Um, and when that industry um, left for various reasons, um, it left us with um, with some vacancy in our city. So right now we're um, at less than half of that population. We're hovering around 600,000. Um, and so you can imagine that when all those people leave, um, they leave abandoned houses, um, they leave abandoned build buildings, um, and we have um, this polka dot kind of of a city um, remaining. Um, and people have done some amazing things um, in our city. Um, just to give you a snapshot, there are many neighborhoods in our city who are dense and, and look and look like the top three pictures here, almost opulent in some, some neighborhoods. Um, and then you have neighborhoods um, who haven't received the same attention, um, who have um, been thoroughly divested in um, and if you find yourself in one of these neighborhoods, um, it actually, um, for some and for some in the farming community, has brought a sense of creativity of what to do with the vacant land that they see around us. And that's how we have um, such a burgeoning um, urban farming community here in Detroit. Um, that little young person right there, that's me when I first started gardening here in the city. I said, I'm going to take on three lots down the street, and there was room to expand around. I found myself um, as a young person rebelling against the system and totally, um, uh, <laughs> I had dropped out of school, I had dropped out of work, and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to farm, I'm going to grow my own food, and, um, 
and and that's where I was um and that that's where I was and I I um I started this farm down the street from my house here and I bring this picture up and and the lesson that came to mind here um was just start and and perfect later um don't wait for the perfect plan start where you are with whatever resources skills and knowledge you are that you currently have um, it's probably the most powerful step that you could take is just to get going. Um, I'm a Virgo, so <laughs> that means that um, I uh, I tend to uh, want to perfect things. I I, I can't have this uh, paralysis of of, uh, of analysis where I just think about it, think about it, think about it. Um, but taking that first step is really um, an important thing, and you have to know that you may not have it all figured out. There is no way that I could have known. Um, when I started this garden um, at 20, I think I was right about 21, 20, 20, 20 21, um, when I started this garden that um, I would go on to do all the things that I've done here in the city uh, 15, 20 years later. So, and I'll talk about some of those things, but get started. You may not have it all figured out, uh, but just start somewhere is the first lesson that I wanted to share um, from my experience here. Um. That's me, <laughs> my little guy. Uh, you see my ashamed face. Um, again, you're, you're not gonna have it perfect, right? Um, but I kept growing, I kept learning. Um, and you know, that's how gardening is, right? You learn you learn something new every season. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's my emphasis to, uh, to, to don't make, make sure you don't get it perfect. It's okay, <laughs> just get started. Um, from there, you know, um, after I started that garden, I um, took a farm um, apprenticeship program in the city, um, and I became a part of a of a network in the city supporting gardens across across the city. Here's our here's the map of, of, of the city. Here's the famous eight mile at the top. Um, down here is Belal, and you can see this is all of the gardens we have currently. Um, over 2,000 gardens in our city. So some of those are just like in the backyard and some of those are larger projects. Um, a couple lots here, five, six, seven lots. Some people have um, larger gardens. I think the largest in, in the city is seven, seven, to, seven to eight acres. So it became, a, um, you know, uh, um, starting out as a farm apprentice, I, um, I worked really hard and stayed on at that nonprofit farm that I was working at and, um, you know, became a manager and eventually um, became the director of that department. So it's that who would have known. <laughs> All right. This is my next big, big lesson. And um, I think that you can apply this in, in a lot of different ways. Um, this is one of my mentors. Um, this is Bob Malik Yakini, and, and you may be familiar with his work. Uh, with the Detroit People's Food Co-op Co or um, Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. He's um, pretty famous on, on the food scene. Um, and um, I consider him a mentor. I call him to make a decision. He's one of a couple of mentors that I've collected along the way. <laughs> um, but I just encourage you to seek guidance from those who come before you. Um, mentors often are able to offer you insight um, help you navigate challenges and avoid uh, pitfalls that they've already encountered, right? Um, also, it's it's kind of just respectful to consult with the experience of people who came before you. Um, incorporate their insights into your work, um, and that and that will foster that collaborative spirit that we're talking about. Um, there's a deep wisdom in collective history and the struggles of those who came before us. Um, so. I just wanna acknowledge that and honor that. And this is a practice that I do um, in every new space that I'm in. I try to make time to talk to um, the people who came before me, the elders, um, and uh, I definitely um, want to add that to add that to our list of lessons here. <laughs> All right. So this lesson is tell your story and speak for the heart. And hopefully I've screen shared to where you can hear this. I think that, you know, you have to like check a little button, um, but Paige, can you let me know if you can hear this? If not, I'll start over. Can you hear that, Paige? I couldn't hear it. You can hear it? Okay. All right. No, I'm going to keep going. Couldn't. You could not? Uh-uh. 
Okay, let me let me stop and let me share again and make sure I check that little button for people. Because this is a cool video. Now where do I gotta check share sound? Oh, right. I think we're there. I need your help one more time, Paige. Okay, tell me if you hear it. Okay. Um, in honor. Yeah, it's of good. Juneteenth, keep running. Detroit, okay. Uh, Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and. Okay. Wait, I'm just going to stop right here because do y'all see the tiredness in my eyes? <laughs> I was tired, uh, a long day on the farm, and this was during COVID. Um, so I just wanted to say that out loud. <laughs> and Urban Farm are collaborating to bring you the Black Farmer Land Fund. Um, wanted to tell you why it's so important for me really quickly. I'm out here harvesting, but... I had a moment and I wanted to tell you, um, I work with folks in community who are trying to purchase land. That's one of the things I do at Keep Growing Detroit. And uh, for several years, I found that um, it's just easier uh, for white growers to purchase land. Um, it's easier for them to navigate the system. And I find that um, it's really an uneven playing field. Um, oftentimes, um, I'll tell you a story. I have a friend who is uh, a farmer. I'm not gonna say her name, but she's one of the dopest black farmers in the city. Um, and she's growing with her family and they're doing a really good job. At one point they were like the top selling black growers in the city and they didn't own the land that they were growing on. And I'm like, this is crazy. For a couple thousand dollars, we can make sure that your land's secure. Now, we all know that things are changing in the city. Development is happening um, at a quicker pace. And I'm worried that people who are growing on their land and they don't own it, that they're going to start to get displaced. It's really important that we make sure that black farmers have the capital that they need to be successful farmers in the city. Uh, our city, as you know, is 85% black and we need to make sure that growers of color can um, access uh, land at the same rate that any other grower can. So, that's why it's important for me. And um, I hope that you find it in your heart to contribute to this cause. Five, 10, 15, 20, whatever you got. <laughs> Put it on the table for black farmers in the city of Detroit. Um, it's I'll stop there, but um, I really like this video. And this is uh, right when we kicked off the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund, which um, was to date. Which um, <laughs> has has um, supported over 70 plus um, uh, farmers purchase land in the city today uh, to date a little backdrop I mentioned all of that all of that vacant land that we have in the city um, and you know we have a lot of vacant land but it was really hard to purchase land and because it was tied up in all of this bureaucracy and title work and also, many different entities owned land in the city at the time, and um, and it was doubly hard to purchase land to farm right in inside of Detroit because uh, there was not and then at one point we didn't have ordinances that allowed that, and and we could talk for days about it. But um, I want to just tell you, like that was my story. I was supporting um, all farmers in the city. I was doing land and policy work for a nonprofit called Keep Growing Detroit. And I was just, I just noticed something. I noticed that more white farmers that I was working with um, own their property as opposed to black farmers. And, and when I say that, that might sound weird, but here in Detroit, we were, we had, we had been through bankruptcy. There's so much vacant land. You might just see three, four, five lots and just start growing on it. I call it gorilla garden, right? And so, um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there was uh, some development pressure that began to happen where, um, 
you know, we saw uh, developers buying land from, from, you know, where farmers used was were growing. They had no legal right to the land. And so it became this, you know, big struggle who actually owns the land, who does it, is the person who stores it or the person who got the money. And um, anyway, we decided to make this effort to make sure that farmers uh, were legitimized so that they had uh, all the paperwork they needed to prove ownership of the land, all of those permits they needed from the city. We went on this mission and, and as we did, we noticed that, um, that more white farmers had it than black farmers. So this was my experience. I'll say we started off this project um, thinking that we were going to raise about five. I was like, well, let's well, let's raise five thousand dollars. That was actually our limit on uh, what is the the app where you you know uh, get um, donations or whatever. And that was our limit that we set. Um, Go find me or whatever. So <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I thought, okay, we can you know help a couple farmers that I knew. Da 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 da. Uh, come to find out. This this video and we each all of us that were organizing this work did like a personal video of why this was important to us. Uh, those went viral, and we in a matter of um, in a matter of a few months, the community had pulled together and we had raised um, sixty thousand dollars just from donations, not from foundations or funders or government money. That was just people giving five, ten, fifteen dollars um, to this cause, um, and. Um, it was amazing. So what we thought was going to be this small project turned into um, what today is is a beautiful um, project. And I think I have some Peace picture family. of, uh, yeah, here's one of our cohorts. Um, so how many people we've um, been able to impact with this project. And this is our current website. Uh, this is some of the organizers here. Um, our new director, Gabby. Uh, we just we just hired a director like we didn't know <laughs> we didn't know when we started that it was going to be that big and we've um we've 70 almost probably this is a couple couple weeks old now probably um we're probably at 75 awardees are now land owners here in the city um so that brings me to my next uh my next uh my next lesson learned here is um build a strong team uh, because you can't do it alone. Um, so a huge part of collectivism is understanding that we are stronger together. Um, you know, we've, um, I think that one of the gifts and talents of an organizer is to be able to see different talents and people. And you are supposed to use that to pull your team together. Um, so you want to look for those people that, um, uh, that you know feel a particular niche that you need in, in your um, in your team and um, who bring out the strengths in each other um, and, and and build that team so that you're not just um, out here doing trying to do the work all along whether you're doing a small community garden I see a lot of community gardens um, are just like one person deep or uh, a lot of farming operations larger farmer operations that are um, trying to get it together with just a husband and wife and Sometimes you need to, uh, you know, just take a second and and build up build up that team. So, so those are some lessons from the Black Farmer Land Fund, and I do want to share a word from one of our co-founders because it's kind of amazing. So, just bear with me for a second. This is Mama Jerry speaking. a network with each other and work together and before you know it the black farmer land fund experience will be strong all over the city of detroit and we will be working in a way that people can see that food insecurity is no more all right all right um, I want to uh, go on to another body of work that I've done here in the city, and this is, um, these are the organizers of uh, Black to the Land Coalition. This group got together. We are all um, 
were all working in, um, we were all kind of like black and brown um, workers inside of like white led organizations. Um, so um, I was working at Keeper and Detroit, which at the time was a white led organization. Um, and um, Antonio was working at National Wildlife Federation. Uh, Chris was working at Detroit Outdoors here. Aaron is at the Sierra Club. Um, uh, DJ was working at um, the YMCA. Um, we all shared a similar uh, story and struggle and also have began to see that uh, the white-led organizations that we were working for could not translate to our people in the same way um, that uh, that we thought, you know, would would be most effective, and uh, we all have began to like do different organizing work, and um, we pulled together. Uh, so now we, you know, we all are. We all had our own little niche. Uh, for me, I'm a kayaker. Um, you know, Mudu, he's a, a mushroom guy. He likes to do the mushroom foraging. Um, you know, uh, B. Anthony here, he's a, a survivalist, so he does. Um, like emergency preparedness and all that. So we were all doing these uh, different events, um, but we all had this theme of wanting to, of both having this experience of working with white led orgs as black and brown bodies, and then also um, wanting to um, organize in our communities kind of in a different way. So um, this lesson is, you know, find your passion, do the things that you love to do. I tell my I tell my kids this all the time. Find something you love to do and try to make some money off of it, right? <laughs> um, find your passion and find your people. Um, this is uh, an important part of collectivism. Um, this is some of the work that we've uh, that we've done with Black to the Land. Um, I love to see you know all the faces when people are doing new new things and trying new things and getting outdoors. Um, and that's really, um, you know, beautiful part, beautiful part of our work. And it brings me to um, kind of my next, uh, my next point here is to be sure that you document your work. Um, it's a part of the journey to document your work. Uh, keep track of what you're doing. That could be as simple as, you know, making sure you keep up with your Instagram page, documenting the crops you're growing, documenting it as you're organizing together and the different, um, um, uh, things that you want to advocate for, document, 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 so you can look back and reflect on your work and the leaders that come next after you have something to build off of. Um, so some of that includes some of the nitty gritty work, like um, being sure that you have somebody that dedicated to just like capturing meeting notes, having a place to put them, making sure that you capture the decisions that you made so you can build on those things setting goals and then kind of systematically tra tracking off where you've been and, pro and progressing through your goals, um, making sure that you keep all the beautiful photographs and, and have a place to store them. So, you know, if a funder or somebody else who's uh, interested in your work um, wants to see what you've been doing, they have kind of a catalog right there. Um, it's also really important, and this is kind of a point that may not be totally uh, clear up front, but Sometimes we get into a mindset where we have like a single leader who has all of the information in their mind. Um, and it's really hard to like share the load when all of the information is in one person's mind. Um, and so having a way to transparently document things, um, all your files and have those in order, it really does help to not just have this one leader uh, mindset that we're all leaders and we all need access. Um, to, you know, to, to that shared information. This is us on a, on a snow trip. Um, and uh, the lesson here for me is uh, to cultivate leadership intentionally. And sometimes that means stepping back. Um, a big part of, of the culture of collectivism is learning to, uh, is learning to cultivate leaders and uh, leadership in others. Um, which sometimes means that you have to step back in order to allow other people to step up. Um, you may be a natural, natural born leader, uh, right? And and sometimes um, you need to make sure that you're allowing space for other voices to um, to emerge. And here in Black to Land, we intentionally 
involve uh, family so that we have an intergenerational situation going on. Um, so we're always kind of flooding new leadership into position. Um, this is a big part of collectivism is the village is uh, not just the one person that's the shiny hero, right? It's about the how we're all lifting up um, in this work. Um, and kind of a part of that, um, and I just threw it right here on this slide, was that um, everybody in the organization has a role. Um, so going back to the picture that you saw of me in the garden, right? You know, uh, collect, like getting the neighbors out, right? Like I, everybody had a role. So the elder next door, she was on tomatoes. <laughs> the older guy down the street, all he wanted to do was help mow the lawn. He didn't want to touch the tomatoes or touch the food, but he wanted to mow the lawn and keep it keep it looking good, right? And then I had a couple builders who helped me build a fence. And so everybody has a role and they're equally important. And that is a big part um, of this notion of collectivism, right? All right, this is us out at the sugar bush. So we were uh, boiling up some maple syrup that we had collected. Um, and I love this picture, um, but I'm gonna tell you one of, one of the secrets of organizing um, is the meeting before the meeting. <laughs> and the meeting between the meetings and the meeting after the meetings. And what do I mean by this? Is staying in good communication with your team. Um, you know, uh, sometimes when uh, you have a new idea that you want to present, um, make sure that you're not just talking to your team, you know, on Zoom or in the boardroom at the selected meeting type. Sometimes, you know, great conversation can happen right there on the porch. Uh, you know, sidebar coffees. Um, sometimes it's great to introduce the idea. Um, so right here, I'll give you an example. We have Black to Land Coalition. Um, we have like nine, nine board members. And uh, <laughs> I had this idea after the elections to like, you know, everybody's kind of like in a space again. You know, I won't get into what your po politics are, but, you know, everybody had feelings behind the election. And, um, you know, it was really apparent. And, uh, you know, I had this idea of, um, you know, organizing a, a call with our membership and just talking these things out. But before I presented this new idea, it's something we never really done before. I went to each individual person <laughs> on our team before I got to the meeting and suggested it in the meeting and didn't really give people a chance to like, uh, you know, to really digest and think about it and give their input. I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with about six people just randomly when I saw them somewhere. Hey, what do you think about this? I'm kind of thinking about this direction. You know what I'm saying? So that way um, I can get their feedback before I even take it to the formal board meeting or, or whatever and um, and uh, kind of refine my idea, get their input either which way. Um, and I do this, I find myself doing this a lot, right? <laughs> I do this a lot. And it's that, it's that thread that kind of keeps, keeps us all together. So um, the meeting before the meeting, between the meeting and after the meeting, that's, that's lesson number eight. <laughs> all right. Lesson number nine is to be sure that you advocate for what you believe in. So I was on this farming tip for almost 15 years in the city. Um, I also... Um, was doing this policy and land advocacy work with Black Farmer Land Fund. And um, our mayor was proposing a uh, a new concept that he just, I heard about it on the news. It was called the land value tax. So I mentioned it here in Detroit, we have a lot of vacant land. So his idea was to tax, uh, triple the taxes on land and decrease the taxes on homes which sounds great because our taxes are crazy in the city and it's really oppressive. But, um, it you know, it sounded like a great idea, but remember, I just got all these people property. And that means that they just became landowners and they land was, the taxes on their land was about to triple. And I was like, oh, oh no. You know what I'm saying? Oh no, we got to figure out a way around this. So every meeting I could get in, I got in, and I started talking stuff about the land value tax and how it would impact farmers. And next thing you know, I got invited to a meeting with the mayor and his team um, because I had been rambling my mouth, right? <laughs> uh, so it was, a, it was a couple of farmers and us in um, in this meeting with the mayor. 
And one of the things we, we again, we had met before the meeting, we had already met to have our game plan ready for mayor. And we had a list of things we wanted to get from him. We wanted to talk about the land value tax, but we were also gonna use that opportunity to talk about um, a number of things that have been ailing us in the city, including water access and land access. And one of the things that we wanted, we wanted a liaison with the city. Uh, we had had a couple of people inside city government who were, you know, um, advocates of the farming community and would help us with different policy initiatives. Um, but we didn't have a firm person. That person had retired. And we said, we want a liaison in the city, you know. And so we're talking with mayor, we're talking with his team. And, um, you know, <laughs> my, my comrade texts me, he says, um, don't forget about the liaison thing, right? You know, because I wasn't even going to say it. So I said, hey, you know, Mayor, uh, one of the things, a number of cities have uh, directors of urban agriculture. You know, you may want to consider this, right? I thought this was down the road, and I definitely didn't think that I would be on his list for that. He looked down and he looked up. He said, that's a great idea, and I think I know who I want to do it. You know, and I laughed it off because you have to, if you know anything about me, and most of you don't on the call, but I've been over the years slightly anti-government. So <laughs> I just knew <laughs> that he was going to check out my Facebook page or Instagram posts and, and be like, she's not the one. Like I've been kind of um, a, a, a rebel all my life a little bit um, and challenging the system and not afraid to talk about it. And um, and so, uh, so yeah, it was in that meeting that... Um, that he decided to have the first Detroit's first urban farming director. And um, two weeks later, I got a call and he wanted me on the team. I couldn't believe it. And this was last year, September last year. Yeah. So um, advocate for what you believe in and uh, be strategic in it. And that's that lesson. So now, um, you know, one year later, the sustainability director um, left. So he asked me, this is our mayor, Duggan, right here. Um, this is our um, director of the Department of Neighborhoods. Um, he asked me to step into the role of uh, director of sustainability. Um, and this puts me in a, in a, in a position because again, I told you, I'm, I'm all about the people. I'm an organizer. I'm not a city government person, right? <laughs> I'm really not that person. Um, and again, I'm very critical I'm critical of government from time to time. And so my lesson here is no matter where you're at, um, wherever you, whatever room you find yourself in, uh, stay true to yourself, um, stay true to your values. Um, and that's what I'm being challenged with right now is to stay true to myself, stay true to my roots, right? And so... Um, so I wanted to share that one with you. Um, those are the 10 lessons that came up for me. I'm gonna pause uh, for a second. If you ever wanna get in touch with me, if you're ever in the city, um, this QR code will lead you to my email. Um, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm gonna be in the city. I wanna link up with you. I would love to chat with you guys. Or if you have uh, similar programs you know, in your city that you wanna discuss, happy to do that and make some time. You can also book some time on my calendar at that link. But really quickly, um, Paige, is it okay? And do we have time? I really wanted to, um, uh, I wanted, really wanted people to drop in the chat, you know, lessons that they have learned, or even if we have a few good ones, um, come off the mic and talk about lessons they have learned in their, um, in their years of, of organizing or, or um, working, working on the farm, things that they've learned that they would like to share with the group. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds great. We have till 7.15. So yeah, maybe we can do that. And if folks want to like raise your hand um, and then we can we can call on you if you wanted to come off mic. All right. Uh, or we can just have if there's any um, general questions or thoughts about the presentation too. But I, you know, I am an avid learner and I know for sure that <laughs> just because you have a keynote or a director on your name, uh, you, uh, I'm here to learn uh, as well. So if you can share, share things with me um, that you've learned along the way, I'd love to hear it. Uh, 
I know y'all been doing a lot some of good organizers in this room. I, I know. I'm like, I know y'all been doing some good work, and I know I didn't list all of them. <laughs> um, okay. Maybe folks uh, don't want to say something, or is there things in the chat that came up, maybe? Somebody called out the uh, the uh, Milwaukee Collaborative Harambe. That's cool. Anybody can somebody tell me? If Efrat, can you tell me about that? Or do you want to say anything about that? All right. <laughs> all right. Well, if there's no thoughts on all force people, maybe people are just having a uh, cool evening. Um, oh, son, please. Hi, um, I really appreciated your presentation. Um, I, yeah, I live in uh, South Carolina and I haven't heard too much about what's happening in Detroit, but I do hear kind of like through the network um, just how much, um, yeah, how much gardening is happening in um, in the area and I think that's really awesome um so I'm not sure if this is this was covered just because I had to hop off for a second but I think in my time of organizing um I'm in my 20s so it hasn't been I haven't had so much time organizing but I would say that um it's like developing a mindfulness practice for myself has been really important um just so that way like I'm able to process what is happening and like really be able to move through the world um from a very centered place or at least as centered as I can be in that moment so um yeah I think that feels like that's something that I would add to the conversation and I, I feel that. complete in that thanks for that son I appreciate that that's absolutely absolutely the truth I used to come home from events and like sage down or whatever your <laughs> whatever your uh practice is hot bath um very 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 good point love it um I saw somebody turn their camera on did you want to speak uh that was an accent I was just uh, entering the room uh, but I'm glad to be here with, with you all and hey Paige Okay, awesome. You missed the whole thing. Anybody at one of the farmer watch parties <laughs> want to hop in with some some thoughts from the group or something like that? Am I, Wait, oh. Am I on? Yep. Oh, hi. <laughs> My name is Kara. I'm from Lansing, Michigan, and I'm here with a group with uh, Magnolia Ab Farm. And our question was, like, you had talked about not being somebody that uh, traditionally felt really connected to your government. And there may have been times where you felt like very much in conflict with your personal values versus what you were trying to do from like an organizing standpoint. How have you been able to reconcile those differences and still like influence meaningful work or, or just how are you kind of working through those feelings and still like getting the work done, but also working with politicians or folks that you may have like very strong differences of opinion with that's a that's a that's a great question um you made me you made me sigh <laughs> 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 um take a deep breath and do sun's uh you know grounding exercise okay so um this is a big one I, when I, um, I told you whenever I need to make a, a big decision, I reach out to my mentors. So absolutely, uh, before I went to the city government, um, I did just that. And, um, you know, actually Baba Malik gave me a good gem. Uh, he says, stack your money. And uh, if they make you compromise yourself, uh, be out, you know what I mean? And so um, that's my plan. <laughs> I haven't yet felt, um, uh, um, fully compromised in that way. Um, I think that um, I'm learning a lot of lessons and I also see myself um, as kind of a strategic player um, in the situation. So I, I don't, I, I, 
I expect that I'm not gonna um, agree with everybody on the scene, but um, I know that um, if I don't under, so there was a point in my life when you saw me in my twenties there, I had totally dropped out of society. Like I, uh, yeah, I was like a poor righteous teacher. Like I, I dropped out of school. I dropped out of work. I didn't work for 10 years of my life because I didn't want to be a part of this system and perpetuate this system. Um, and so, um, you know, I say that to say that, um, you know, as I navigate, uh, as I navigate uh, this space, um, that's something that, that, that grounds me. And also like, um, I, you know, I, I didn't think that policy was really the answer. Um, so a number of the initiatives I've been, I've been involved with is because I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that the power is in the people and that I didn't think government was the answer. So I never really paid it. Like, I didn't really pay attention to government, you know what I'm saying? In that way, like, I didn't know some of our council members. I didn't know, like, the relationships um, and, like, the government structure, you know what I'm saying? Like, the different departments. And as I, like, navigate that scene, I am learning, you know, um, where there was a time to totally rebel against it and there's also a time to learn about it because there's um there are um a number of things that we can get done like just today just today page we got the the farm ordinance passed um where we can now have city chickens right so that was a work that took 10 years and took a lot of people you know pressing on council and understanding how to talk to different people in government right and Sometimes if you're not at that table, you know, you could be as rebellious as you want to. Um, and that's cool. That's one lesson, right? And that's one path. And there's a there's a room for that, right? Um, but then there's another path that I'm learning um, where you're actually in the room and you're challenging. And that means that you have to rub, you have to be right there with people you may not agree with. You know what I'm saying? So um, I know it's a little bit long winded there but um that and I'll say you know we'll see uh I, well maybe we can circle back in a year and I'll let you know but I'm only a year in and I haven't felt totally compromised yet um so thank you for that question that was that was a really reflective question Thank you. We appreciate your thoughtful response and your presentation we struggled with trying to find a question to ask because you really your values really resonated with us as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. Hey to everybody in the background. <laughs> Hello. Oh, y'all party. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. So, you know, if you if you just joined us or if you didn't see, I you know, we're just welcoming people to say different lessons that they've learned along their way. Um I know I didn't hit all of them. These were some of them that that resonated with with uh, with me when um, when young farmers reached out. <laughs> um, but I know there's probably more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with uh, the group that just spoke in terms of the presentation and it was great. Um, and you did cover really the breadth of lessons. Uh, anyway, regardless, uh, in terms of sharing, like something I've learned uh, is really just the resonance of like the, the phrase in the matter of boots refer to the boot maker, just to trust the experience and authority of those who've done the thing, which really is just a parallel statement to your um, to what you shared about speaking to those who've come before us. And so, yeah, it was great. And I was really grateful to be able to be here today. So thank you. I love that. 
I never heard it phrased in that way, but I love that. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Yeah, Gabriel, go ahead. Howdy. I just got a quick question in relationship to Detroit and um, it being a majority Black city and the struggles that the Black communities faced um, over the years. Um, and I guess I'm curious, you know, bringing up um, the uh, founding of um, the land fund, um, you know, addressing the disparity of of white people uh, having a lot easier access and, uh, to land and money. Um, do you have anything more to add to the white folks that are on this call that, um, yeah, maybe could use some extra guidance or maybe that's not the right word, but I might be botching this, but um, <laughs> you might get the gist, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, when, um, you know, I see my comrade Shakira on the line, Shakira, if you have anything that you want to say, um, because Shakira was with me with the Black Farmer Land Farm from the beginning. And, um, you know, um, I think that, oh man, there's a couple of lessons. Um, there's a couple of lessons uh, to say. And um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say, I'll tell you that I'm, I'm multiracial myself. So I have white ancestry, African ancestry. I have indigenous ancestry, um, and so, you know, I just say that to say, like, I've been in personal, intimate family spaces with, with all of those, um, those backgrounds, and so, um, you know, I, I come, I come to the conversation, you know, in loving, and. Um, and I and I um I think that when we did the Black Farmer Land Fund, I think so many white farmers actually like resonated with what we were saying and were happy to like have this like outlet. Like we had a number of black of white farmers um donating. We had white people like calling us and still to this day have white people calling us asking us if they have some land that they want to donate, can we connect them with a black farmer? Um I think that's um I think that's definitely part of the work. Um I'll also share that uh I mentioned that like Keyboard Detroit where I was working for a long time. Um, you know, when I first started working there, I got out of farm apprenticeship and I started working with that group of folks. Um, I was the only brown person on their staff. So um, you know, it was um really, really challenging to see like a group of, you know, 10 plus um, white people inside of Detroit, you know, for those who um, don't know the demographics right off, but Detroit is definitely a black city, like um, Gabrielle said, like um, Gabrielle said, like it's um, um, about, I think our demographics are like 85% black is one of the blackest cities in the North, in the North um, percentage wise. And um, so to see like, you know, and then we have a large um, Hispanic community as well. So like white people really only make up about 5% of our city over the years. Um, and so to see like a group of minorities in the city, like running an urban agriculture department yes. um, was, was really rough. And um, I remember like uh, one of our retreats uh, that I went to, um, and I was the only brown person there and they were talking about the different like connections and like different restaurants where they were selling their food and like the different connections that they had, um, and like the different networks of white people basically in the city. And, um, you know, I started crying at the retreat and, and I said like, this is why black people 
are afraid of gentrification or don't like gentrification. This is why. Reportedly, was based on chicken processing companies in this case that employed folks. Evidence of the bad acts, the items. Um. Um. Yeah, so um, just to go back, like, uh, I, you know, I just remember saying that, like, uh, it's not about, like, um, just the presence of white people coming back. That is, like, scary, I think. It's, like, what they bring in terms of, like, um, power often and connections that um, perpetuate an imbalance, you know what I'm saying? And so I guess I say that to say like, um, we all have like a tendency to like stay in our groupings. Um, and I, um, you know, I just challenge, I, I like to, I just challenge white people to like understand that like in your grouping in America, you hold an, an exorbitant amount, an unfair amount of power and wealth. And, and, um, and so, understanding that um you know that in order to like walk kind of in a justice way you will need to like open up your your comfort zone of grouping so that you can share that to the collective more um yeah those are the things that like stand out to your question uh gabe and you know i invite in other um black and brown folks who have um, had similar experiences to, um, to speak to that as well, if you'd like. We've got about five more minutes if anyone else wants to ask a question. Go for it, Adrian. Thanks. Um, I have a question about, um, you talked about how there had been, in your advocacy work, there had been allies. I'm gonna go off camera because it feels so weird to talk to like, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Adrian with Young Farmers. Um, you talked about like advocating with the city and and having some allies within city government who are helping move forward some of the policy. And then suddenly there came this sustainability position that you hold. Do you can you identify like when the city realized that would be necessary or like what convinced them that that kind of support would be necessary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. Um... So um, yeah, before sustainability, I was um, urban ag director, and I think um, it was actually literally Adrian that meeting. I literally like I don't think that mayor had the idea before. Um, I literally saw the light bulb going off in his head that here we had like a constituency of people who had issues, and like this liaison um, position would be great. I also think it helped that I compared it to other cities. <laughs> And I was like, you know, New York has one and Atlanta has one, you know what I'm saying? So there was a bit of like, oh, you know what I'm saying? And he's also like preparing to uh, leave office next year. So like, um, you know, I think it was like a perfect uh, whirlwind that, that, but he did step up and, and, and um, create that position, you know? So, so yeah, there's lots of like strategy around like, there's so much strategy in, in politics that I'm learning, you know what I'm saying? And like when we can get certain legislation passed, because like next year for Detroit, um, we'll be getting, um, uh, you know, a new mayor and new council. And like, so we're talking about like some of the composting policy that we want to pass and like, oh, next year might not be that great because, you know, who wants to like put their name on some composting policy right before they leave, you know, so all these like strategic things to think about, you know, um, that like before I would just, you know, did the, did the compost and not cared about what <laughs> necessarily. So um 
but then I probably would have got a ticket and there we go. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> but thank you, yeah. We got time for one more. Okay, I'm gonna, oh, Takiya, you go ahead. Peace, peace, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Peace. So, um, hello, hey T, hey Paige, I'm Takedia, and um, I would say that um, the biggest thing that um, that I've learned and I take away from my farming experience would be to um, pose a question and remember it and don't stop until it's answered, right? And so... When I started farming, I started farming to feed my family. But when I decided to expand that work outside of just my own backyard and uh, when I decided to expand my work um, into a broader community, um, I did that to answer uh, a very specific question. And that was um, how much food, how sustainable, how self-sufficient could uh, a family be in an average lot in Kent County? And um, as I sit here in this space right now, feeling like farming uh, has taken more than it has ever given, um, my son asked me why I keep going. And that is simply because um, I haven't got my question answered yet. So um, I just would like everybody to think about that. And just to remember, it's another kind of vein of remembering and knowing what your why is. But yeah, post a question, remember it, and don't stop until it's answered. I love that. Thank you, Takedia. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Takedia. And thank you so much, T. Um, really just want to emphasize what you were saying about we just got to start somewhere, you know, um, that's how I ended up getting to know Takedia and we get to work together on the, the West Michigan Farmers of Color Land Fund project now. And um, yeah, just getting started to know each other and work together led to like years later, the project having funding and being able to get grant funding. So um, just want to encourage y'all to start having those convos with the people, you know, you know, um, all right, well, we're going to sort of close out here with some written works from Sophie Strand. And um, Sophie's going to be sharing some of her writings with us. I introduced her um, a little earlier, but I'll remind y'all she's based in the Hudson Valley in New York. And she's a poet and writer who focuses on the intersection of spirituality, storytelling, and ecology. And I know many of y'all and the farmer friends in my life are huge fans of hers. Um, so if you guys want to check out her other work, she's got some awesome publications. The Flowering Wand is a really great one and The Madonna Secret. So check those out if you enjoy her work. So Sophie, feel free to take it away. Hi, Paige. Thanks so much. That was just such an incredible presentation. Um, I'm honored to be here. My brother is a farmer and I feel like I got more of a window into the things, the question, big questions he's asking right now. Um, and I can't wait to share with him and to talk with him. Um, let me try and make this a little brighter. There we go. Um, so I don't have any practical wisdom. Um, and I do think this is a moment for practical wisdom. And, and that was incredible. Um, but I do have poetry um, and words. And I'll offer that to the compost heap. This is a piece called Symbiotic Resilience. Step into the forest. Feel the plush imprint of your heels in moss, scent the brightness of pine needles crushed underfoot. Birds call through wild rose bushes, lacing up the greenery with their love songs. The world scintillates with late summer sunlight. Webs of song and pollen and spores tie together, kin, united by a shared desire to mate, to eat good food, and to create relationships. 
and below your foot, printing into a small patch of dirt lies another world that nourishes these above ground floral perfumes and sturdy trees. Modern advances in forest ecology and fungal science have showed us that ecosystems are tied together by the connective tissue of the underworld, where in order to survive, beings need to melt their ideas of singular selves and singular species. Let us travel down on mycelial threads into the oldest underworld myth, one that predates human heroes, one that even predates trees. 500 million years ago, plants drifted from the sea to the shore to dry land. These were not the plants you or I would recognize today, not the pumpkin and its vine, the glossy lozenge of a corn kernel ripening under its green husk or the shivering field of wheat upon which we depend and feast. These first plants were vagabond and in need of help. They had no root systems. Luckily enough, fungi were already intimate with the soil in over tens of millions of years Fungi acted as surrogate root systems for the plants that would slowly develop into the forests and food bearing crops we depend upon today. Basically everything outside that you see, everything green depends on that one risky decision to burn the bridge to their old body behind them and to jump into this collaboration. While plants have their own rhizomatic networks, they are still only able to access water and nutrients within a tight radius. Mycorrhizal systems that enter into their rhizomes act to extend these vegetal networks, connecting older trees with kin and uniting diverse arrays of vegetal, fungal, and microbial communities. 90% of plants depend on their fungal helpers. The connection is so strong that endophytic fungi are vertically transferred to the newer generation through seeds. When the fungi live in the very seed that will become a tree, their role lives somewhere between midwife, parent, lover, and friend, helping the tree to tap into the rich nutrients of the soil and the community of other species that constitute an ecosystem. Put more simply, fungi taught plants how to enter into the underworld, and it was only in the darkness of soil that plants learned how to make community. Community that bridged differences in species, in age, in biosemiotic languages. Fungi taught plants that survival isn't actually about individuation. It isn't about being a hero. It's about becoming radically involved. So involved that you let your friends into your very genetics, into your root systems. Fungi taught plants how to root into ecosystems and into relationship. Funny that now they have emerged into popular culture when we seem to so desperately need an underworld journey ourselves. A real underworld journey is not a journey somewhere else. It is a journey into your landscape and your ecology of kin. The beings that by the magic of metabolism rebuild our very bodies with every biome laced breath and bite of food. Deep in the soil, we can come to the intimate realization that we are constituted by hundreds of relationships. The food we eat, the people that grow our food, the insects that pollinate the flowers, the friends that support us, the weather systems that shape the flavor of our days. I'm not demonizing stories of ascent and heroic individuals. Perhaps they've had their place. Deep times seasons are longer than human lifetimes. Perhaps whole civilizations have followed spores upwards on the wind. But it seems now that we are being invited into a collaborative, soil-bounded descent that delights in mess, darkness, ferment, and most importantly, delights in co-creation. If fungi have taught me anything, it is to get involved, to behave interrogatively with my environment and my neighbors. Why does the rustle in my cilia support the Monotropa uniflora without receiving anything in return? I'm not sure. But I know that I have benefited from the stories of people who do not know me and have never received explicit nourishment in return. I have eaten fish from seas I have not fed my tears. I have eaten fruit fattened on rain that does not know my name. Let me give gladly, remembering the underworld lesson of early vegetation and mycorrhizal fungi. 
Biology's idea of giving aid doesn't believe in a logic of fair transaction. It believes in the creative act of the connectivity itself. Fungal webs act like interspecies messengers, ferrying nutrients and chemical missives between trees, nourishing young plants, providing a highway for bacterial colonies, breaking down dead matter and liberating minerals, acting as the living connective tissue of the soil. We honor that our bodies are built from interspecies collaboration with every step we take that drums a vibration down through that soil, up into up to 300 miles of fungal cells. Underground fungal systems show us that no one who needs to eat, who needs water, who needs roots and help and a sense of home is truly an individual. Our roots are all tied together. Every being, plant, insect, bacteria, mushroom, or animal depends on a tangled network of relationships. The word ecology comes from the Greek word oikos for household. Every footstep we take in the soil, every seed we press into the ground plants us deep into a shared household of messy mutual responsibility and possibility. Every inhalation laced with dust and funk in pheromones loops us into a physical reciprocity with landscape. We may look like individual human beings, but we depend intimately on the support of our household of relationships. And if you cut one thread from that web, the entire oikos, the entire ecological household begins to fray. A tree goes extinct and then the squirrel dependent on its nuts for survival is also threatened. Pesticides kill off the bees that pollinate flowers that in turn are mutually connected to fungi below ground. Just as forests are large systems composed of smaller beings tied together by relationships, so are our own bodies delicate ecologies of complex life. We now know that we contain more bacterial cells than we do human cells. Our gut is a teeming tropical environment composed of up to 500 different bacterial strains, microbial romances and dramas playing out every time we eat a meal. Fungi weave between our eyelashes and festoon our skin and our physical health is dependent on a constant conversation between these different beings. The bacteria in your gut misplaced somewhere else in your body can kill you. And alternatively, the lack of healthy microbes can fray your own healthy household. Like fungi and plants, we are co-becoming with our ecosystems. Ecosystems that are ruptured, polluted, and confused by our culture's deracinated idea that you can live without a root system. But if we are going to survive, we are going to need to tie our roots to other roots. Resilience ecology tells us that landscapes with more biodiversity, more overall connectivity, are better able to withstand natural disasters and climatological pressures. We are going to need to drop below human exceptionalism into the underworld of symbiotic co-creation. This strange warm autumn, with the first forest fires in the Hudson Valley I have ever seen, as the leaves go liquid and then soften into soil, I'm asking the fungi to teach us symbiotic survival like they taught plants 500 million years ago. Teach us how to root into a specific place and into a specific community. Teach us how to create connections so feral and far reaching they make us resilient with otherness. Teach us how to flow into our whole household of kin and connection. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was beautiful. Um, I hope everyone's leaving today feeling inspired to work with those around you. Um, I can't do this alone, so get started. And if y'all are interested in um, continuing to join us in Young Farmers Spaces, we are having another meeting on Thursday, and that's gonna be about hurricane relief for farmers um, Zachariah, did you want to say a word about that talk on Thursday? I'm going to drop the link in the chat if folks want to register. Yeah, sure. Uh, peace, y'all. I'm Zachariah, and I'm the Southeast version of Paige um, here at Young Farmers Coalition. Um, so the conversation we're going to be having on Thursday will begin at 3 p.m. EST, um, and it's after summer where most of the U.S. underwent 
a historic heat wave. And then obviously in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Helene, um, we wanted to create a space to think together and also resonate with each other about um, the intersection is almost too loose of a word, but the reality of agriculture in the era of climate survival and increasing climate crisis, um, the implications on us as farmers, but also the implications of how farming and agriculture can be a part of how we, uh, I mean, this is, I'm feeling very influenced by this poem right now, <laughs> um, but how we can, how we can uh, uh, create stronger and more resilient communities um, through agricultural movements and networks. So that's what we'll be getting into on Thursday. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going, uh, please join. Great. Thanks, Zacharia. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And thank you, T and Sophie, for sharing your wisdom.